This is our call of the laity by O.V. Cruz, Archbishop O.V. Cruz. This is episode three. We'll begin at page eight. This is a study guide. Part one, page eight, Code of Canon Law. Normative, authoritative, and definitive. These are the proper attributes that can be appended to the three pivotal legislations about the laity in the Code of Canon Law. They are cited below and commented on. While the laity is found mentioned in several books of the whole code, except in provisions categorically pertaining to the religious and clergy, it is these three codal legislations that declare and promote the significant figure, distinct status, and pursuant role of the laity in and for the church, comma, viz, V-I-Z, in the church, of which they are constituent members for the church, whose apostolic works include the promotion of social welfare or the common good. These special and specialized agenda in the temporal order should be the particular concern of the laity. They are thereby canonically enjoined and expected to attend to this agenda. The fact that the Catholic laity could not have been given due attention and pursuant recognition as to who and what they really are in the life, concerns, and works of the Church does not subtract in any way from the objective truth as to how the Church looks at them, comma, what ecclesial potentials they have, and what the Church expects from them. They have much to contribute to the realization of the mission of the Church, they have much to do in the undertaking and in the promotion of the works of the apostolate and of charity to which the church is inherently committed. They are very relevant persons, particularly in today's world, as can be gleaned from signs symptomatic of a socially and morally errant times. <clears throat> now I'm going to move to page 9. It is not uncommon for the lay Christian faithful to think that they are but passive sons and daughters of the church. By and large, they do not act without first being asked by the clergy, thinking that they cannot do much if the hierarchy does not expressly commission or delegate them to do so. This is the reason why most members of the laity feel that on their own, they are second or third class members of the church. A significant number of the laity have the understanding, impression, or feeling that there is a real, a real distinction between them and the church. They think that the church as such is something rather dis distant from them, an intangible reality. In fact, they are members of the laity. They are members of the laity who commonly... In fact, there are members of the laity who commonly identify the church with bishops and priests, consciously or unconsciously, considering themselves as people outside the church. Surprisingly, pitifully, as well, this is a fundamentally wrong perception, a radically erroneous feeling that persists. Why? <clears throat> there can be only three primary reasons for this unfortunate situation of the laity. Even after no less than some 500 years since the church's incarnation in this country, the first reason is that the clergy have not sufficiently catechized or appraised the laity about who and what they are in and for the church. The second is that the members of the laity themselves have not understood well that the clergy taught what the clergy taught and told them regarding their status and role in the church. The third is that both the clergy and the laity have not given due attention to the truth about what and who both are in and for the church, such as their essentially complementary ecclesial figures. Such as their essentially complementary ecclesial figures. 
At the same, there is no reason why the lady should not know what they have, a, that, know that they have a significant standing in the church to which they belong, considering especially the solid statistical fact that they constitute no less than some 99.96% of their total membership, as earlier stated. <coughs> We're now moving to page 10. Thus it could be said at all the reality thus it could be said at all the reality is that the laity is the church more than the religious and the clergy after all the laity to constitute after all the latter to constitute only 0.04% of the church in the Philippines the dogmatic truth is that the church is the laity the religious and the clergy as one and the same organic composite people of God. They are distinct in their ecclesiastical status, but complementary in their respective ecclesial roles. While not one of them may claim that he or she alone is the church, he or she nevertheless forms an integral, integral part of the church, namely that he or she and the church as a whole are, in truth, one inseparable reality. In other words, a lay person carries with him or her the nature of the church as long as he or she remains her faithful son or daughter. The three following salient canonical provisions clearly demonstrate who are the laity. These legislations are for the observance of the universal church, with no exception or exemption. They are declarative and normative in nature, with no conditionality attached. They are meant for the laity, the religious, and the clergy to know and to understand under pain of culpable ignorance. <coughs> Let my voice take a break, and he's going to go on and talk about those three canons. It's canon 203, canon 208, and canon 225. So I'm going to move on, and uh, I was trying to keep these to eight minutes, but the demand is, exceeds that, so I'm going to add on. We're now moving to Article 1, and it's going to be Canon 203, Paragraph 1, CIC. And I'll read you, and, and I want you to think of this as the mindset of the church. You're, this is a study guide. All right, this is to complement what his writings here, so you'll hear a comment from me. I'll try to keep it to a limit. This is a guide, a study guide. Now, Keep in mind what he says about canon law. It's the mindset of the church. Your priest can have his opinion. He may want uh, coffee with cream or sugar, and you may want it black. But keep in mind there's always the mindset of the church, particularly on important and valuable concepts, such as we're talking about here. What is your role? What will you be judged upon? The cr canon 203, the cr Paragraph 1. The Christ's faithful are those who, since they are incorporated into Christ through baptism, are constituted the people of God. For this reason, they participate in their own way in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly office of Christ. They are called, each according to his or her particular condition, to exercise the mission which Christ entrusted to the church to fulfill in the world. And think about that. That's pretty powerful. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read that one more time. The Christ's faithful are those who, since they are incorporated into Christ through baptism, are constituted the people of God. For this reason, they participate in their own way in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly office of Christ. They are called, each according to his or her particular condition, to exercise the mission which Christ entrusted to the church to fulfill in the world. That's the quote. I'm going to move on to the body of the book, page 11 here, where Archbishop continues in his own words. To better understand and duly appreciate the significance, substance, and implication of the above-cited canonical provision, it would be necessary to analyze its expression, such as, one, Christ's faithful. Now remember, the Archbishop is a canon lawyer, but not only that, a judge at appellate levels in the church. You have the, or, you have the ordinary court, 
and then you have appellate level. So he's a judge and familiar with all levels. One, Christ faithful. This is another way of saying the Christian faithful, i.e., faithful to the teachings of Christ and wherefore Christ's followers, composed by the laity, the men and women religious, and clergy. They are the people who follow not only the words of Christ, but also his life and spirit, something that can be found in and learned from the gospel that narrated the historical Christ from his conception to his resurrection, resurrection up to his second advent for the last judgment of humankind at the end time. It is evident that there is noted up to this point is what is noted up to this point is a very poor and deficient way of explaining who the, who the Christ faithful are, but is nevertheless a sound, thorough, and elementary beginning. Let me read that again. Christ faithful. This is another way to saying the Christian faithful. That is faithful to the teachings of Christ, and wherefore Christ's followers, composed by the laity, the men and women religious, and the clergy. They are the people who follow not only the words of Christ. I'm going to repeat that. They are the people who not follow not only the words of Christ, but also his life and spirit, something that can be found in and learned from the gospel that narrated the historical Christ from his conception to his resurrection up to his second advent for the last judgment of humankind at the end time. It is evident that the, what is noted up to this point is a very poor and deficient way of explaining who the Christ's faithful are. But it is nevertheless a sound throw an elementary beginning. I'm moving from page 11 to page 12. <clears throat> For certain, it is vanity to think that someone would really have faith in the doctrinal pronouncements of Christ without hoping in his promises or, and or without loving his person, which is Christ himself. His person, which Christ himself equates with obeying his commandments. See John 14, 15. And which he, too, summed up in loving, in loving God and neighbor. See if Matthew 22, 37. In theological language, this is known as the connectio virtutum, as the connectio virtutum, the interlocking of Christian virtues. This has special relevance for the theological virtues that have God as its primary objective focus. These virtues are faith, hope, and love. <clears throat> Needless to say, to claim legitimately and licitly the title of Christian, faithful, as far as the church is concerned, one's faith, hope, and love have to find their concrete manifestation in his or her participation in the sacramental and liturgical life of the church in obedience to the vicar of Christ as a supreme pontiff in the universal church. More than the theological virtues of hope and love, which by and large are indefinite and undefined, undefined in more concrete and detailed terms, it is a theological virtue of faith that finds its specific or concrete articulation in the Apostles' Creed. One's, one's Christian faith is substantially explicated by the profession of the said creed, which clearly expresses the fundamental articles of the Catholic faith. This could be the reason why the followers of Christ are simply called Christian faithful, i.e. people with faith in Christ thereby presuming anything and everything else that go therewith, such as precisely the exercise, the likewise theological virtues of hope and love. As a practical truth, it, it can be said that there are so many ways of following Christ, possibly as many as the number of his followers. This is true not only among the members of the laity, but also among the religious and clergy. By way of description, there are those who follow Christ in truth or in name, up close or from a distance, depending upon, depending on the given situation, all the way or in some way. I'm moving to page 13. This, 
This simply means that lay persons, religious men and women, and clerics as well in, in repose their faith, hope, and love in God through Christ in practically infinite ways and pursuant degrees. Somehow this is what makes the difference among the Christian faithful who are the pride or the shame of the church, who are the assets or the liabilities of ecclesial communities, and who thus add or subtract from the holiness of the church and her relevance in the secular world. One immediate conclusion that could be drawn from the above is that to claim that one is a Christian faithful in the correct and real sense of the title means so very much more than is easily and repeatedly said. It is even more even it is even doubtful if an expert theologian theologian could exhaust the integral integral notion and complete connotation of being an, an honest to goodness Christian faithful. All the above explanations are nothing more than a superficial attempt at saying who and what Christ's faithful are. There is always something more profound and more meaningful that can be said about the, ident the identifying title of Christian faithful. The more one looks into it, examine and reflect uh, its content, There's always something more profound and more meaningful that can be said about identifying title, the identifying title of Christian faithful. The more one looks into it, examine and reflect on its content and intent, the more some other signal truths can be discovered in the learned fr from the rather common and plain two-word title. Two. It's page 13. Incorporate. It's now going to go into the word incorporate. Christ Christian Faithful Incorporated. In the secular world, incorporation usually refers to a group of individuals putting their respective assets together such as such that these are considered by law as one composite material whole. The latter's increase or decrease, gain or loss, is altogether independent of the persons who placed and combined their resources. Hence, the main factors of the reality of incorporation in the temporal world are the following. One, that it concerns persons and their possessions. Two, that the individuals thus concerned are held definitely distinct from what they owe, own. Three, that what are really held together as one composite. Moving to page 14 for those who are visibly impaired. Whole are their temporal possessions. Clearly not the persons qua different owners thereof. This is the way of the commercial world. In the particular case referred to by the code, it is the people themselves who become constituent and integrating, integrating parts of someone else. The individuals become one in and with somebody else. The persons are made one with a spiritual and supernatural bond such that they become members of one mystical body whose head is none other than Christ himself. This similar and profound incorporation has the following distinct elements. One, that it is the persons themselves who are intimately bound and made one with their individual wealth or poverty held essentially irrelevant. <coughs> Two, that the said persons become one living corporate whole by the profession of one and the same faith and by the observance of one and the same morality. And three, that the same persons become precisely one ecclesial body of people called by God, the faithful to Christ as their head. The people of God, the mystical body of Christ, or simply the church, is the unique and immense living entity that those incorporated persons bring to reality. Among its main attributions are the following. One, that it is a worldwide body of believers in and followers of Christ. Two, that while the individuals concerned speak different languages, come from various races, have distinct cultures, and live in separate continents, they are but one ecclesial family. And three, that as but one people, one body, one church, 
they have the same ecclesial elders in the hierarchy ministering to them, the same Holy Father exercising family rule, the same Christ heading them from above. Many different peoples made into one people, millions of individuals composing one ecclesial family. This singular and special oneness is caused by virtue of a mysterious bond. Page 15. Is caused by a mysterious bond that makes them precisely the mystical body of Christ. This mystical bond effective of one mystical body draws its origin primarily from the following three profound living realities. One, the reality of but one Christ from the start to the end of time. Two, the reality of one salvific birth, teaching and passion, death, resurrection, and ascension to Christ. And three, the reality of one spiritual grace flowing into and among Christ's faithful, inspiring, strengthening, and sanctifying them. In addition to being but one and only mystical corporate people, they also have the rightful claim to be members of the church which is holy, Catholic, and apostolic. That is to say, first holy, because their head is holy, teaching them a holy doctrine, providing them with holy sacraments, giving them holy liturgical observances, and preparing for them a holy destiny. Second, Catholic, because they are one people such as wherever they go at whatever time of the year and with whomever in the world, they feel and experience a sense of belonging to one ecclesial universal family when they come to the worship, come to worship together by saying the same prayers, participating in the same liturgy, making the same sign of the cross among many other practices. And third, apostolic, because they profess the creed of the first apostles themselves. They trace their origin to the evangelizing works of the first apostolic community in the same way that their ordained elders trace their origin from them. Three, baptism. It is the reception of the sacrament of baptism that is the fundamental start of the incorporation of someone into the mystical body of Christ. This is why a baptized individual is considered a new person before the Father with the Son in the Holy Spirit. This sacred and noble truth is apparently easily said, but not readily understood. We are now on page 16. That is, the reception of the sacrament of baptism effectively makes someone, somebody else, as a Christian faithful. However, it can somehow still be explained in plain language. The person is said to be new, not really because personhood is changed. What is actually altered is his or her status and his or her consequent personality before God and before the church. From an infidel to a faithful one. This is the change in status, V-I-Z, from that of an unbeliever to a follower of Christ, from a human nature soiled with original sin to one cleansed with the salvific grace won by Christ. This is the change in status, viz, from the rejection of that adoption as a child of the Father, from one disowned to an heir of the eternal kingdom, open by the redemption of humanity brought about by the person, death, by the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. <clears throat> the newness of the person is real before the Father. In other words, it was the person of a man and a woman that the Father created to his image. It was also these persons who thereafter turned their back to the Father. But time came when they were again enabled to face the Father by the redeeming actions of Christ on their behalf. The mere potentiality to stand before the Father was brought to actuality by their faith in Christ, signified through their reception by the sacrament of baptism. 
Thus it is that every redeemed, baptized, and faithful person becomes a creation with a new standing before the Father. The newness of this person is possible in the Holy Spirit. Humanity has, was long blinded by original sin. It made men and women lose their way to their assigned destiny. Thus, they needed a guiding light, an inspiring grace, and a salvific force for them to find once again the right way, know the eternal truth, and have everlasting life. All these, and now on page 17, all these became a real possibility through the intervention of the Holy Spirit. All these eventually turned into actuality for all those members of humanity who became believers, who were baptized, and who thereby became new persons in the Holy Spirit. The newness of the person is true with the Son. When men and women became a new creation before the Father and in the Holy Spirit, it is with the accompaniment of the Son. The truth is that created by the Father, the truth is that created by the Father and enlightened by the Holy Spirit, the sacrament of baptism cleansed people from their original sinful stain through the redeeming grace won by Christ, through his incarnation as the Son of the Father, by the intervention of the Holy Spirit. In other words, it is both a supernatural truth and a historical fact that men and women become new persons with the Son as the incarnate Christ who still heads and leads them in their ongoing pilgrimage to the eternal kingdom of the Father. Four, people of God. The baptized who are incorporated into Christ are themselves in the baptized who are incorporated into Christ are themselves in, in effect made the constituent members of the people of God. This is a consecrated reality found on the committed relationship between God and the chosen people. B-I-Z, visualize. He is their God and they are his people. This is the covenant between God and a chosen portion of humanity, whereby the former becomes their God and the latter in turn becomes his people. This is a testament of faith, i.e. God making himself the object of faith and his people reposing their faith in him. That's powerful. The bapt I'm going to repeat that. The baptized who are incorporated into Christ are themselves, in effect, made the constituent members of the people of God. This is a consecrated reality found on the committed relationship between God and the chosen people, B-I-Z. He is their God, and they are his people. This is the covenant between God and a chosen portion of humanity, whereby the former becomes their God, and the latter, in turn, becomes his people. This is the testament of faith, i.e., God making himself the object of faith and his people reposing their faith in him. What is immediately evident is the infinite inequality between covenanted parties. On one hand, God stoops down to make a commitment. I'm moving to page 18. Make a commitment with the people he simply created. On the other, that lowly people are thereby effectively elevated by God by committing themselves to him. This gross inequality is biblically expressed through the mystifying statements made by God himself. I shall be your God and you shall be my people. Le Le uh, Leviticus 26.12 This immediately reveals the graciousness of God and the blessedness of his people, strangely founded on this infinite goodness and the pitiful condition of the people he calls his own. The fundamental reality God opted for in this covenant with his people is hopefully a bilateral fidelity. <coughs> this simply means that just as God would never abandon the people he calls his own, he calls his own, would that his people never abandon or renounce him as their one and true God. I'm going to repeat that. This simply means that just as God would never abandon a people he calls his own, would that his, this people never abandon or renounce him as their one and only true God. Common knowledge, however, 
readily attests to the fact that while God, the good Lord keeps his commitment under all circumstances and in all times, his people, a good number thereof, at least do exactly the opposite. This usually happens when they choose instead to worship worldly vice, earthly wealth, and or forbidden flesh, as if any or even all of these would in any way take the place of God. Let me repeat that. This is a good meditation. This usually happens when they choose instead to worship worldly vice, earthly wealth, and or forbidden flesh, as if any or even all these could in any way take the place of God. I continue. Fidelity is the cornerstone of the covenant between God and his people. That God keeps his word is all is altogether beyond question. But that his people keep their word is precisely the big issue and problem. This was true before the becoming of Christ. This was true before the coming of Christ. This was true after his coming. And this remains true to this time and age. But this matter cannot be left indefinitely unconsidered and unresolved. Such ultimate consideration and resolution come with the second and last advent of Christ, when it will become definite and defined, B-I-Z, who are really God's faithful people, and who are otherwise by their persistent betrayal and adamant denial of him. I'm going to this. Moving to page 19. As previously said, <clears throat> the people of God, the Christian faithful, or the church, is the composite of the baptized laity, the avowed religious, and the ordained clergy. Absolutely no member of these three uh, sections of God's people is exempted from fidelity to the covenant, precisely under penalty of separation from his love, his grace, his kingdom. Contrary to common perception, it is not true that clerics and religious should be more faithful to God than the lay men and lay women in the church. They are equally obliged to be faithful to the good Lord. This, the difference, however, is that the members of the clergy and religious are more accountable for their infidelity. Reason, they must know better and wherefore should act better. Number five, participate. <coughs> Briefly and plainly to be participant in something is to take part therein. Evidently to take part is to be actively involved in whatever agenda one participates in. Participation immediately connotates joining a plan to be observed, a program to be accomplished, or a project to be done. Participation infallibly implies a mandate to be fulfilled or a work to be accomplished, or an event to be present, pre, uh, presence, or an event to be presence. Furthermore, when one is expressly asked to participate in something, this means that he or she certainly has an active part, a dynamic role to fulfill. The antithesis of participating is to be passive, indifferent, or even rejective of taking part in something that should be done. Before God and man, it is truly frustrating to express and formally ask someone to be part of something only to be rejected. This is especially true in participation. If participation is not altogether voluntary, but actually mandatory for the good, not only of the agenda, but also for the benefit of the participants themselves. It can be legitimately said that without a part, the whole is incomplete. Among other things, this indicates how significantly, how significant every Christian faithful is in the church. Moving from page 19 to page 20. <clears throat> now, on page 20, I'll begin, but I have a note. I uh, failed to correct what is materially wrong, so we'll come back to that maybe in a, a follow-up guide. I continue. Both the text and context of the law clearly convey that envisioned participation is not altogether optional. This is especially true because the norm be, because the norm of much concerned with because the norm is much concerned with an ecclesial agenda that the Christian faithful are explicitly enjoined to take part in. Categorically, 
as followers of Christ. This participation is intended to continue the evangelizing work Christ did during his earthly sojourn. This way, through the active participatory presence of the Christian faithful in the here and now Christian agenda, as it, it, it is as if Christ were still physically present in the world, in the time and the age they actually live. Time and again in the history of the world and humanity, it happens that there are so many virtuous things that are left undone, just as there are so many vicious items that remain uncorrected. Reason, the inaction of people supposedly of goodwill. It is a fallacy to say that it is enough for good people not to do anything for evil individuals to thrive. The profound falsity is this, often repeated maxim, is that it is incongruous to qualify people as good when they precisely do nothing to correct what is manifestly wrong. They do not only see no evil, hear no evil, say no evil, but exactly do nothing good either. Let me repeat that. <clears throat> Time and again in the history of the world and humanity, it happens that there are so many virtuous things that are left undone just as there are so many vicious items that remain uncorrected. Reason? The inaction of people supposedly of goodwill. It is a fallacy to say that it is enough for good people to not, not to do anything for evil individuals to thrive. The profound falsity is this often repeated maxim is that it is incongruous to qualify people as good when they precisely do nothing to correct what is manifestly wrong. They do not only see no evil, Hear no evil, say no evil, but exactly do nothing either. From the above, one conclusion, one conclusion clearly emerges that in a very special and distinct way, no member of the Christian faithful may licitly do nothing good or not participate in something good. This is particularly true in the ecclesial agenda, viz. the IZ, viz. things in and for the church, among the people of God, or in favor of people who do not belong. Therefore, precisely to bring them ultimately into the fold of Christ. This is precisely the reason why Christian repentance is directed not only against sins of commission, but also against those of omission. There is no strong presumption that the good things not done are much more in quantity and quality than all evil deeds perpetrated. This is not hard to recognize. Just look at what's happening in our times. Let me repeat this. You're seeing many of the new saints coming out about this that uh, you know and we'll get into them later on but uh, 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 Oscar Romero Saint Oscar Romero Bishop L let me let me state this one more time from the above one conclusion clearly emerges that is very special and distinct way in a distinct way no member of the Christian faithful may illicitly do nothing good or not participate in something good this is particularly true in the ecclesial agenda, the IZ, things in and for the church, among the people of God, or in favor of people who do not, do not belong, therefore precisely to bring them ultimately into the fold of Christ. This is precisely the reason why Christian repentance is directed not only against sins of commission, things, sins of commission, things you do, but also against those of omission. There is strong presumption that the good things not done are much more in quantity and quality than the evil deeds perpetrated. This is not hard to recognize. Just look at what's happening in our times. Let me add on to that gloss here. So uh, there's a strong presumption that the good things not done, that's our omissions, are much more in quantity and quality than evil deeds perpetrated, meaning the darkness, the chaos is overtaking because of the acts of omission. People don't do things, all right? Keep that in mind. That's what he's saying there. And the, the tr in the ecclesial agenda, ecclesiology, for our, my purpose and for our purpose and my take on it, and you can check it out, ecclesiology is, is uh, how we live in community, how ecclesiology is uh, there's what to believe, how to act, and how to perfect one's actions. What to believe is dogmatic theology. How to act is moral theology. How to perfect one's actions is spiritual theology, of, of which there's two, two parts of that, ascetical theology and mystical theology. 
So that when he's saying here is the ecclesial agenda is our functioning, how 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 your family functions at a family reunion, at a family dinner, at fam how you live under that roof. That's ecclesia for our purposes, ecclesiology, ecclesial. Okay, take a look at that. It's very powerful. All right, we're at the 40 minute mark. And if we were doing formation, I wouldn't go much beyond one hour. So I'm going to take a peek here. We're at page 21, and I don't know if I can finish this without doing two sections. And so I'm starting to call for what? So we're going to end at page 20. We'll pick up at page 21 next time around. Leave comments if you think that's too uh, disruptive. But uh, this is very powerful, and uh, this can change change lives, communities in the future. Okay, we not only we have a role to play, and in America, and the Catholic Church has been my experience that we often live in um, conflict with that idea, and the problem has been, in in my experience, the clergy and staff. And if at this time of this tape, 80% of the people, more than 80% in America, have no longer, no longer take direction from the clergy, no longer will seek it, no longer will accept it if it's offered. And so some say, well, that, that the church has been driven into the ditch. The church is there. It's just that the uh, people, um, they, they blame Catholicism. Catholicism is to be blamed. It's just right here. There are bad actors. And, it's, and they don't want you to have a voice, meaning the good people, the laity, and we're going to have a voice. That's part of this ministry here. We're going to have a voice. We're going to share our voice. And we've had nothing but opposition. So I keep us in your thoughts and prayers. Offer up your suffering for our ministry. We are a voice. You are all called to be a voice, to just speak the truth. And if you see something, say something. And that's the whole Bishop Barron, his letter to the suffering church how to write letters. Our letters are rejected. I mean, nothing works. They, You have these rules, we follow them, and it still doesn't come out right. That's because there's individuals in the church. You need good people. You need processes and procedures that have to be engaged. And if you don't know about them, you don't engage them. And that gives you access to the Holy Spirit. A second opinion is a simple process. If your priest says something that's contrary to common sense. Common sense was the first part of the rule of light that St. Albert the Great gave Teresa a uh, great gave the Carmelites back in the old days. Common sense. Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.